my life? Am I live? I am live now. Okay, cool. So we were having technical issues here. Um, guys, welcome to the Cyber Hub Engage. We are live from the Active Cyber Defense uh, Challenge that the NTSC and TAG are hosting here at Midtown Atlanta at the 12 Hotel in Atlantic Station. I'm joined by the very charming, most recently joining the civilian workforce, Major General Patricia Frost. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It Appreciate is our it. pleasure to have you. So we just went through a tabletop exercise where you were kind of walking around and kind of getting an impression of it all. But you are a Major General in the yes. U.S. U.S. Army. Army. Yes. So thank you for your service. Thank you. And... You're retired now. Yes. Well, you've joined the civilians. Side. Yes, I have moved away from Department of Defense type industries uh -huh. and now going completely public private sector on the industrial based side, but not necessarily those that are building technologies for DOD. Okay. So, <laughs> first of all, Major General, I mean, I think we're just now starting to see women really take leadership roles in the military. And I don't want to go down the sexist route of, oh, women yeah, don't get sad. enough opportunities, but um, there is a, sh we were talking earlier on the table, there's a shortage of people who can serve. Can serve that meet the requirement, the qualifications to exactly. serve. And unfortunately right now in our youth between 18 and 25, it's due to obesity in America and also the medications that our adolescents are being given. So those are two major impacts on a very small population. But do you feel we need to change our standards to the technology piece of the service? So if someone is going into cyber IT operations, those may not that, be at peak a physical debate. condition? That's a debate, but at the end of the day, as a, as a Marine would say or a soldier would say, you're a soldier. Right. You are part of the U.S. Army, and there is a standard to being part of the United States Army. And you'd never know, because we hope to grow, and I, I can't say we anymore, <laughs> the Army you know, is looking to bring cyber down to the tactical edge. That means you have to not be a detriment to that unit that you're supporting. So you want soldiers, every soldier, to meet the standards of service. So I, I know it's a debate right now. My, my personal opinion is every soldier is a soldier and you should just meet the Army standard and that shouldn't change, regardless of your military occupational specialty. I couldn't agree more with you on that aspect because I think once a soldier is the brotherhood, I mean, I remember going through basic, that's where you develop your closest relationships, that's where you learn how to overcome your largest you know, challenges and biggest objections and you kind of learn how to you deal with confidence. adversity. Right, but you it, learn how to deal. I, I, I think people who join the service are already confident in a way or another. I mean, I, I think that group divides into two. You've got the shy, you know, person, and then you've got the overly confident macho people who but come you in. Grow. You but you grow. You, you do grow. You change. You know, if you're between 18 and 25 and you get thrown into this military environment, regardless of the type of service, any of our services, you are going to change. And you're going to learn what it is to lean on others, rely on that team. And it is, you know, for the Army, it's that life and death. I mean, at a young age, I went to airborne school. I'm jumping out of a perfectly good airplane, you know, airplane as a like paratrooper. I take that. So you're relying on the person who inspects a jump master, who inspects your equipment. Right. I mean, there is a trust factor there that you know, you're, as a paratrooper, that team aspect and, and what you learn about each other sitting on green ramp and many hours in your kit and then getting on a perfectly good airplane. I mean, these are all things that just, all of these experiences, and I think when everyone says, well, what did you, what do you miss about the Army the most? And it's the people. It's the relationships that I have built and developed over time. And it, it really is the it's people. Difficult. It's, it's, it's very, like a breakup when you leave. It is a breakup. And it's yeah. just, I know that I'll have those relationships for the rest of my life. That you're just not going to take away anyone that I deployed in combat with. That is something that's just instantaneous when I see them again. Where do you see cyber um, public-private partnership? You, you come from the DOD side, obviously. Now you're on the civilian side. Do you feel like there's the end kick and there's so many different information exchange organizations out there? Where can the pro and people are always saying, how can the government get better? Let me right. kind of so give this to you. I, I how can it. how can private be better to work with government? So I think there's a lack of understanding 
between how the government views the environment and how public and private sector is looking at the environment. So as I, you know, came over and put a civilian a civilian <laughs> uniform on and I'm learning what the business side of of this is, you know, I could have gone and and worked for some fabulous industry partners that I've known throughout my army career. But having spent the last five years with Army Cyber Command and working with the United States Cyber Command, I realized that the capacity that we were building, it can only go so far. Right. And we have a soft underbelly of America that sits in our cities and our municipalities at the state level. We have a soft underbelly that's in our utilities. It's everything that, you know, a crisis comes, you know, our... Our, our power grid, our water supply, just our basic needs. And so how do we ensure, and those are all, and there's critical infrastructure within the U.S. government system, I have that, but there's a lot of other industries that also are critical. We have a rail system, we have a transportation system that does things that are outside of just supporting Department of Defense. And that's a whole soft underbelly that needs to be looked at. And then I was like, I, it's a call to action is get these very, very um, astute CEOs and chairmen to say there needs to be a call to action in this space. And how can we get from the bottom up, kind of reaching the federal side? So you're gonna, you're gonna get these industry partners to push up of what they need and shape the type of information exchanges that need to occur, relationships that need to be built. Where are the ISACs? Can the ISACs play a role in that? So the ISACs are a huge role. So, and we probably haven't covered all of them that need to be built. Right. And so there are ISACs right now, and there are other industries that are saying, I really don't fit into any of those ISACs. I'll give an example like the steel industry. Do they sit in mineral and mining? A lot of them would say, I really don't fit in that one. So maybe there needs to be a steel ISAC. So, I mean, I think... Couldn't I think they the fall larger in the critical infrastructure as well. I mean, without steel, where would we be? Would we be building with cement? Right, but they just next the way we've defined it, they really actually don't yeah. fall into that one. If you See, I feel like I, I I don't know. That's one of those things where I feel like ISEX are are really too either too defined to where they leave out some of the key components of the supply chain. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you know you can have UPS and 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 and, and, and FedEx and their own ISAC, right? And all the delivery. But I almost think let's leave it to the industry partners to see where they fit and what is most beneficial to them. Well, okay. So for I'm gonna right challenge now. you. For I'm gonna right cha- challenge you on that okay. for a second because yeah. because I like to do that. Number yeah, one, good. but number good. two, I feel like um, that that's where I think I want to see leadership from government, and I'll tell you why. I think there are parts of our industry that companies may not realize there are critical infrastructure, but they are. Um, like it or not, ICE is critical infrastructure, and they were just recently defined as that. Now, they own the New York Stock Exchange and a bunch of other exchanges, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but they're critical infrastructure, because if tomorrow they're ransomware and they have to shut down the New York Stock Exchange, that's crippling our economy. Right. And supply chain would be no different. If someone attacked our ports, that would be our private ports, our... Uh, trucking and transportation across states that would hinder our economy and I think that would be an aspect of critical infrastructure wouldn't it I mean our, our greatness is defined by our economy we cultivated the greatest economy right. on earth known to man ever and many industry partners could all claim that they're critical, critical infrastructure infra- I think that's the definition of the federal government right so the federal government is going to have to decide but my concern is even as you grow the list of what we consider to be critical infrastructure what is the capacity to respond? Because Correct. if you're a critical infrastructure, then you you were kind of thinking that if, if I have a breach or intrusion, that I'm going to have assistance and support. Now, if we get into a nation state type of cyber warfare, you're not gonna be able to respond to everything. The federal government is going to have to rack and stack. So this is where I think within all of our cities, within all of our public and private sector, we've got to build more capacity and depth of the expertise needed to respond to some of these incidents. And as you get into the industrial Internet of Things and just the Internet of Things, having someone who comes to give assistance to a breach in an industrial control system is not the same type of cyber expert that would come for financial services. services. So you really... You have to think through this. We we are lacking some experts 
to be able to fill well, this gap? I, I think we have the experts. I think the challenge is we have so much noise. Um, Jeff and I, and, and you met Jeff, so we did a whole podcast on what makes a cyber expert. Mm -hmm. um, because one of the things that we kept getting feedback from chief information security officers in the private world was, well, you know, I have all these experts come and talk to me, but really what are their qualifications? And here you sit across from me, someone who has the accolades and the qualifications. So um, I'm just gonna do a short pitch for you. So oh, Partners you. in Performance America, um, based out in Maryland, um, and, and I don't know if you guys have a Facebook page or LinkedIn. We do. We ha well, we have a LinkedIn page and we have awesome. a web page. So the website is pipamerica.com. And so you can kind of, if you're a chief information security officer and you're looking to kind of get an expert to, to speak with, I mean, Major General Patricia Frost is awesome. I mean, just we met today and really we didn't talk until about the last hour and I'm like regretting the fact that I let four hours pass by <laughs> before I snapped you because um, we share a lot of very similar ideology and a lot of different beliefs and what makes this country great and um, I mean I'm, I'm very concerned and this is why I went this route is I, I look at the nation state actors and I think our, our country is a little bit asleep and I think uh, many of our industry partners in public and private sector are asleep they'll sit there and go wow that happened my industry partner next door, I'm glad that didn't happen to me in cyberspace. But we have a nation state actor in China that absolutely is expo is extracting intellectual property you know, in, in large amounts every day. For, for their manufacturing purposes, for, their for a way to flood the global marketplace yes, with and to cheap get ahead. products. Yeah. They want to be the global leader. nation, the global leader. I look at Russia in a different way. I look at Russia as actually wants to be destructive of our American way of life, our democratic well, processes, yeah. and that they will also manipulate our social conscience is what we're seeing in social media. Have you been to Russia? I have not, because in my former position, I was actually not allowed to travel to I, Russia or China. I, 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 I was in Russia, and I was um, fascinated by walking into a mall that looked like an American mall. Mm -hmm. um, American cars were the number one cars on the road. I mean, Chevys, Fords, Dodges, you name it, they had it. Old cars, new cars. They had more American cars on the road than German cars. Everyone I spoke with loved America. And, it, and, and I wasn't in Moscow. And I was in different parts of Russia. And, and what fascinated me about that is I feel like the people there love the American way of life. I know that they know our way of life. Well, I think they like... They, the, they understand the things that we make and... The value in, in America. And, um, and, and you see that. I, th I think they have a challenge in leadership. And the leadership doesn't reflect the will of the people. I think we know that Absolutely. hasn't served in the service. A lot of times you meet leaders who allegedly represent their people, but really they represent their own self-interest. I know that Russia is an adversary of our nation, but having spent time and met people there, and when I lived in Israel, I met a lot of people who were of Russian origin who now lived in Israel. And So what is the nation-state intent? Well, their, so intent, their intent is to make us look bad so that they can maintain control on their people. Right. It's so a misinformation. It's, 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 it's undermining our... But it's also what's the intent of the very strategic leaders. Well, well, of the, it's, it's, it's of leadership. The one leader. it's, it's how do I stay in power Right. longer? So my concern is, are we putting the pieces together? Um, I mean, I'm looking at it from the soft underbelly, soft underbelly of America, as we see reconnaissance and surveillance of our networks, as we have intrusions or breaches, if we are not... And I know sharing in this business, everyone, no one likes the term sharing, but if we, if we are not exchanging information, how are we ever going to connect the dots of is there a nation state actor that has intent to do something that is very malicious against our nation, against our way of life, that impacts our civilian communities, our ability to respond. So I think that I'm worried that, that we're not sharing or exchanging the information that needs to be exchanged to understand what could happen to a city, a city Correct. infrastructure. Well, what could happen to our first responders if that's manipulated? So that's where I worry about the, you know, connecting the dots. I, and, and I agree, and I think a lot of times people think of the 
zero day scenario of having no internet or no electricity and I go what happens when we send all of our first responders to point A but point B is the problem you know and, and, right. and our first responders are now stuck in an area where but we're, we're, I mean we were a digital nation but the whole world's digital now wouldn't you agree they are but I think some nations are a little bit more resilient to go analog than others and I think we have a we would have a tougher time to go back to analog. I mean, the city of Atlanta did when they were, yeah. when they, were they couldn't go. I mean, they tried to go analog. They just, they, there was just nothing there. Right. And then you have our cities that have been hit with natural disasters, Panama City, Florida, right. which was just devastating. We just now had Paradise, Paradise California. California. And when you have everything that is destroyed, whether it's by fire or a hurricane, and you realize your dependency of what you need the network for it, it kind of changes your view of how do you even I agree I mean that's that's a very how do you even communicate well that's a very valid point because where I mean a lot of times we we tend to look for government for help right and um, I was I, I had the uh, pleasure last year um, when uh, Secretary Price was still the Homeland Security Secretary right after Harvey hit Houston I was in D.C. And I was in the um, HHS operations under the Secretary's Op Center as we were tracking Jose and Maria as they were making their way up uh, off the Caribbean into the Florida coast and into the, into the state of Georgia. And I was actually on the last flight from Reagan that day to Georgia with a bunch of FEMA. Uh, and how does the city manager actually be able to manage the city when they can't communicate? Well, and, and, and that was really one of th- that was one of the things you know with what I can't I don't want to share it on air. We can talk right. about it off 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 the record um, privately. But um, I was fascinated by um, the challenges that existed. That you know, private may not have that challenge, but on the government side, trying to coordinate all these different hospitals, first responders the path the unpredictability of it right in business everything's kind of predictable you, everything's going to change five ten percent but when you're a government if a hurricane decided to make a hard left at that point mm-hmm. there, there was nothing you could do as government right. at all zero just you just now you're just like all right everyone we, everyone needs to make a hard left and what we can do is what we can do and 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 that's 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 the hard realities of, of so I'm hoping what we're going to do in the future is I hope we're going to really look at operationalizing cyber and get our business leaders having this conversation with partnering with their CIOs and their CISOs of what we're saying of what, what's needed at, on the industry side and getting looking at business imperatives how do you secure and harden what is critical to our businesses and have them having this conversation across our nation. So I got a question for you. Um, I, I made this argument um, about a month and a half ago, two months ago, someone told me it was stupid, but I did it in DC and I don't, never surprise when someone says, I have a stupid idea in Washington. Um, I said, our government needs to develop its own internal process for developing its own communication. So we can't rely on industry to provide us with routers, firewalls, and so forth. We need to develop our own in our government industry to protect our critical data. While industry partners are great, but if a, one part of that product is made in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in a part of a supply chain that we cannot control, we put everything that we have and at I, risk. And I think that entire supply chain discussion needs to come to the forefront. But I think that brings also, again, into our soft underbelly. Right, and, and I think that's our, our soft underbelly, right? right? We put a router in our, in our, in, in our office or a firewall or any sort of machinery, but if it's parts of it are made in China and it's got a back door, or th- the factory may not be in China, let's say in a different country that's a friend of ours, in, 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 in Australia, in Canada, who cares, right? But if one of the employees was malicious, or you know, like the scenario we just went to, is getting blackmail and inserts a back door in the in the. But it part. goes to so I always say there's everyone says say everything in threes, right? So I think there's three things that if you're working in corporate America, public or private, three things you always need to do. One, ISACs is what we have today, right? right? So you have to have an ability with like industry, looking at threat intelligence, understanding what's trending, what y- you should be concerned with. So if small, medium or large company, join an ISAC, understand what's happening in the environment. And then number two, it's your human firewall. How are you training and certifying your IT and cyber workforce based on the hardware and software you have in your company that they can actually optimize the tools that are given to them. 
And then what are you doing with the soft underbelly of just you and I being, you know, the workforce? Right. That they the, have the, to be the, the human. The human element. The human element. They have to be educated. And that's what, that's even across our nation. That's my 14-year-old daughter who's being raised. What type of cyber hygiene are we teaching her? Just as I teach her how to wash her hands and stay. Right. So what's the cyber hygiene she's learning? The third thing, I believe, and this goes into if you can't really look at your supply chain to the fidelity that we probably need to be looking at our supply chain, it's do you have within your corporate network, industrial part of your corporate network, your industrial internet of things and your internet of things, the kill switch? And are you segmented enough? Have you segmented your critical assets, your business imperatives? Are you able to actually, and who has the authority to execute that kill switch? to actually to contain where that breach may have occurred. You, you just brought up that point inside during the tabletop, and I felt like that was a very uh, valid. And I don't think a lot of people can answer that question uh, right. in general. You have to practice it. They can't. You're going to have to get with your, your business leaders and say, when can we actually execute portions of this kill switch? And then for any CIO out there listening, the shadow IT networks have to go. And everyone says, oh, well, we have an exception for this. We have an exception for that. At some point, the it's shadow IT has got to go. You really got to understand your IT assets and what they are and, and what you're trying to secure and harden. So last question for you. Any bold predictions for 2019 in the world of cybersecurity that you want to say you heard it here first? Bold, you're really putting me on the spot. I, I told you I would. But I expect you to be quick on your feet because you're a major general in the know, United States Army, which is the best army on the planet. A bold prediction for 2019. Something that might happen or just... Technology development, a new trend that people will see that they're not really looking at right now. No, I mean, I think we're all watching artificial intelligence and machine learning very carefully and quantum computing. And I mean, that's kind of been kind of the bubble. Right, those right? are the buzzwords. Right those now. are the buzzwords right now. I'm more worried that we're not getting back to basic cyber hygiene, the education and training that needs to be done because as a nation, we're already a digital nation. And I look at my 14-year-old and say, is it just on me to ensure that she understands her cyber hygiene? As I said before, you know, she'll never write a check. Who is teaching her digital financial security? Right? And I know it's getting more. So who's yeah. going to be teaching her that? So I think for 2019, what are we doing to look at the education and training that's needed for all Americans? That you just just can't defer this to someone else and say, well, they're going to make sure I'm secure. I think there's an education and training that needs to be done, and I think we're way behind the power curve. I couldn't agree. We're way more. behind the power curve for that. More. So it has been a pleasure. It has been so. Um, if you're watching, we're here at the uh, 12 Hotel. We're wrapping up today's uh, tag tabletop exercise with the NTSC. Uh, Cyber Hub Engage, I'm James Azar, your host. Major General Thank Patricia you. Frost, thank you for being with us. Um, you can catch us at cyberhubengage.com or follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for tuning in.